Um, it's just gone six o'clock. And so we are starting this evening's presentation. Welcome to everyone who has joined our um, webinar offered by Whale Coast Conservation. Before I introduce our speaker, um, as many of you probably know, last week Hermanus lost one of its great talents, Duncan Butchart, naturalist, photographer, artist, writer, educationalist, conservationist, promoter of eco-travel, but most of all, a bird lover. This generous, talented, extraordinary man will be missed, and we extend our condolences to his family and all his friends, and especially those in the birding community. So it gives me great pleasure then to introduce our speaker this evening, Anton Udendal. Anton has served on the Council of BirdLife South Africa for more than a decade. He is a founder member of both the KZN and Western Cape Birding Forums and a previous chairman, chairman of BirdLife Overberg. He drafted the documents to register the Overstrand region as an important bird and biodiversity area for BirdLife International. He also markets the Western Cape as a top birding destination, develops bird IDs and educational posters, presents online birding courses and other talks, and he writes articles for various publications. So we are indeed privileged to welcome Anton this, Anton this evening as he talks to us about the very special birds of our area. Thank you, Anton, and welcome. It's over to you. No, thank you very much. At last, we are here. Um, I apologize if I had screwed up last time. But um, yes, here we are uh, on a topic that, that is truly important for our area, particularly as far as birding tourism is concerned. It is a matter of impossibility to sp speak in detail about all of our Feinbos or Renosterfeld endemics. In actual fact, one needs to take each one and, and develop a, a sort of an hour long talk on, on each one of them because they all deserve that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly talk you through all the challenges facing these individual species. Um, and then I would like to review BirdLife South Africa's approach to how we should look after Feinbos and then briefly look at the Bird of the Year campaign. Okay. All right. Um, it was a interruption, a brief interruption. Um, and, and then I will review the, the Bird of the Year campaign and what briefly what we are doing concerning the whole matter of ecotourism, but birding tourism, and particularly as far as the Overstrand region is concerned. So I'll talk you through the species one after the other. The Cape Siskin is the one of least concern, the one that we are really not worried about. Um, not much to look at, a very, very small diminutive little canary. Um, the important thing of this bird diagnostically, if you want to ID it, are those zebra linings on the edge of, of the wings and, and the tail. When I say that this bird is small, here it is in comparison to a Cape Canary. Now, this little guy weighs in at 13 gram. If you look at a Cape Sparrow, for argument's sake, they, on average, um, come in at 27 grams. Um, so it's a really, really small bird. But this guy really is above its weight. This guy um, punches above its weight like you cannot believe. It had adapted to um, a whole range of things 
they are always first after a Feinbos fire. We had seen videos of them in actual fact already picking up seeds released through the fire with some embers still smoldering in the background. But most of all, this guy had decided that no, Feinbos is, is not exclusively for me. And they'd gone for a whole range of exotics, which is in a way um, unfortunate, but um, beechwoods, casarinas are the stuff for the siskin. The last 11 times that I had looked at a row of casarinas and gone there, I had found Cape siskins in those casarinas. This is in the Overberg, this is in the Langeberg district, um, all over the show, Witzenberg, etc. These birds had adapted. So if we talk of climate change and, and changing conditions in the Feinbos, this guy had really sorted itself out and um, is of least concern. If I look at the iconic Cape Sugarbird, um, this, this is at Roy Els um, with Bruno Stocco, um, a very popular bird, a bird sought after by birders from all over the world, but they are able to move away from their local areas to other areas. In fact, birds ringed at on the table mountain range, um, get picked up beyond um, Somerset West, etc. Um, they can easily cross the um, Cape Flats if conditions change against them, if they got hit too much fire, etc. Um, they can move away. In fact, Dr. Mark Brown had ringed birds at Nature's Valley and Dr. Ellen Lee had recaptured birds up in the Bavians Kloof, which is as the crow flies 170 kilometers away. So the important thing here is that the Cape sugar bird is able to make fairly large movements um, if environmental conditions don't suit them. But um, there's a lot of research being done into these birds at the moment. There are people working on creating Feinbos patches in the suburbs through um, the Cape Flats, etc., to give these birds a better chance of adapting. There's also very, very interesting research report that, that came out in the, in the last two weeks by a lady called Monique Duplessis, looking at the fact that these birds go into the sugar bird feeders and there's great concern that these birds are not playing their pollinating role in the Feinbos as such. So it's, it's a fairly controversial issue, but if I can just look at um, their adaptation, um, which is interesting, at, in our garden in Onrus, in 2007 and 2008, we only recorded them in the garden for three months of the year, high summer. In the last four years, we had recorded them in our garden for 10 months of the year. So these birds, as far as I'm concerned, are beginning to adapt to gardens, to feeders, to exotics, and, and um, they, they will really utilize a whole range of, of plants um, in order to get their nectar. The big onrus mountain fire of, of, of a few years ago, this photograph I took in Vermont two days after the fire. So they had literally um, left the Feinbos, left the, the burnt out area and had gone into suburbia. and. Um, it seems as if these birds 
are really adapting to gardens and stuff like that. And maybe therefore they will not be under such extreme pressure when we are talking of climate change and diminishing fainbos habitat, et cetera. So it's, it's a controversial issue. There's a lot of research going into it, but um, as far as we are concerned, this bird is also um, not of a lot of conservation concern. But from yarn end, um, it gets a bit hairy. The orange-breasted sunbird, magnificent little guy. Um, research, research indicates that they, in actual fact, hang on proteas, on the side of protea flowers. They do not play a big role in the pollination of protea, but they are erica specialists. And they are very reluctant to leave feinbos habitats you don't find that these birds move into gardens, suburban gardens and stuff like that very often. They, they are reluctant to leave Feinbos and therefore under pressure. The moment you get extensive fires, um, like we are getting increasingly, unfortunately, in Feinbos habitats, these birds are in trouble simply because of the fact that they don't move as far away as you get in the case of, of the sugar birds, but massively sought after in the tourism industry. So this bird seems safe. It doesn't look as if it's got much problems. Um, it's, it's just a matter of the reluctance to leave um, Feinbos as such. You will see that as I go along, it gets worse. Protea seed eater, massively sought after, but incredibly difficult to get. Um, they live at high altitudes in mature feinbos, feinbos that hasn't burnt for 10 years plus, because they, they their prime food, stems from these old dried out protea heads. They feed on those seeds predominantly. Uh, recent research indicates that they in actual fact utilize a whole range of seeds, but they are bound to these old mature feinbos patches at very high altitudes. And they love varbuma. Um, Varboema is, is their, their main hangout spot. A decade ago or so, we um, always said that if you want to get these birds, you have to go to the Pakes Pass outside Clan William. Unfortunately, there was a massive fire through there a few years ago, as you know. So they haven't got those mature habitats. The best spot at this point, um, the most secure spot to look for these birds is in the Gedo Pass, when you, when you go from Cirrus up into the Koa Bokerfeld, um, the per first picnic site on your right-hand side as you go up Gedo um, is a sort of a guarantee to get this massively, massively sought after species. The whites on the wing, um, is, causes it, its Afrikaans name of Witflaer Canari. And then uh, all of the seed eaters have these ivory bowls, hugely sought after. And one of those birds that a lot of experienced birders haven't picked up or, or seen or ticked on their life list yet, hugely sought after, but due to the, the extensive and increasing fires that we're getting, this bird um, is probably in danger of over the next 50 years or so, really battling to survive. Feinbos button quail, note the new name, that other name is, is not used anymore, it's derogatory. 
and therefore I don't use that name. It's called Feinbos button quail now. This is downright impossible. This bird, um, you basically have to find by flushing it. In other words, 10 people or so walk in a straight line and hopefully this bird will, will fly out and give you a brief glimpse of it. Very difficult to get, but Ellen Lee had done extensive research on it. Um, BirdLife Overberg had, had um, contributed um, a lot of money to that research and they had established that this bird is far more common than previously thought. But this is the rub for the Feinbos button quail. Sandy soils, restio dominated Feinbos habitats. And this is um, a Gullis National Park. And, and this is a typical classic um, habitat in which you will find um, the Feinbos button quail. I'm going to speak later on, on this whole concept of um, habitat envelopes or um, stuff like that, in which I'll describe how difficult it is for these birds to um, move from one area to the other. Steve got this bird in Agullis National Park, and that's basically your best chance. Um, you flush it, it flies out, flies for about 30 meters, and then it disappears into the restio again. If you flush it a second time, it'll fly for about 100 yards and, and then just disappear. So very, very difficult to spot and therefore hugely sought after in the AV tourism industry. 20 years ago, 15 years ago or so, Arabella II, uh, between the Gulf Estate and the Roessant Nature Reserve, these birds were very common. They were flushed regularly, but that whole area had now been taken over by exotics. They cannot tolerate dense trees, um, dense vegetation and stuff like that. Um, they want that short, up to about 0.4 of a meter rest year. And that is the habitat that, that they prefer. So the moment you talk of exotics and, and, and um, plants um, growing larger than that, then these birds basically disappear from the area. So as I go along, you will see that these individual species are heavily dependent on specific habitats, specific Feinbos habitats. And, and that causes a problem for their long-term survival. Victrin's warbler is again, a very difficult bird to find. Uh, and, and these birds are basically bracken-based. This is a classic, classic image of the Victorin's warbler in Bracken. Now, just listen to this. They prefer to hang around in Bracken along seeps on the southern slopes of mountains. Now, um, the moment I say that, I obviously imply that this bird has a reduced habitat that it can utilize. It's like a mouse. They are very poor flyers. They, they basically move around in the bracken, feeds in it, goes down to the ground, runs along the ground, go up into the next bush and operate like that. So not very um, easy to find and easy to spot, but um, for us living in Armanis, um, springtime, if you walk up towards the waterfall on Fernkloof, they fall in the seep, that little river just below the trail, incessantly, all the time, 
in, in springtime and, and you are always in with a chance of finding them. Very typical call. Why did you do that? 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 And you could um, be in with a chance of spotting the bird. Um, clean photographs of this bird. You always have to respect whoever it was that took the photograph. This is sort of your typical view that you will get of this species. So both the Feinbos button quail and Victorin's warbler are birds that are not able to fly at very long distances in, in order to escape from um, threats to their habitat. And I will obviously spend more time on this wonderful beast, the Cape Rock Jumper, BirdLife Overberg's logo bird, BirdLife South Africa's Bird of the Year 2021, um, hugely sought after. And the Royal site is critically important to us simply because of the fact that this is essentially the only site where these birds occur at low altitudes and where they are fairly accessible, where you can basically walk to try and get them. Um, awesome birds. They are usually found in, in high altitude Feinbos mountain habitats, such as this, for example. And let me just give you an idea of, of what is threatening this bird. The mountain Feinbos is under threat throughout the Feinbos region. Um, it is dwindling due, as a result of, of warming climate. And um, then the, the fires that we get in these mountains are, are really problematic. These birds appear to be coping after fires. They do stick around, stay in the same area. They don't move away from the area after that burned out. But future climate, scen climate scenarios predict that the Cape Rock Jumper's habitat may decrease by 62% by 2085. Um, that is massive. Um, in the sense that already they have a very small habitat type that they can utilize. And if this type of thing does happen, then surely this bird is going to be under pressure. They need more water than the typical songbird that occurs in, in warm habitats. They, um, whenever then, they have not enough food as an insect and or drinking water, these birds will gradually come under threat with dehydration um, if our dry summers persist, which it will do. I would like to just um, concentrate on Krista Oswill's fantastic doctoral thesis and the work that she had done. She had come up with a concept called Sky Islands. A Sky Island is essentially that top of the mountain ranges that these rock jumpers prefer, the Swartbergpas, and these type of, of habitats. High altitude Feinbos, mountain Feinbos, um, and they essentially live in these sky islands on top of the mountains. I took this photograph from Rotary Drive just to give you an idea of the problems of these birds. These birds find it downright impossible to move from here, Rotary Drive, up to the mountains in the interior. They, they are probably unable to cross the Yimelin Arde 
that in. Um, I just showed you that slide just to give you a feel for what's going on. These high mountain ranges are separated by inhos inhospitable valleys of, of semi-desert Karoo or agriculture that can be up to 30 kilometers wide. These valleys are likely to widen due to warming temperatures and leading to the cooler Feinbos habitat retreating up the slopes of the mountains. So these sky islands, other people prefer to call it climate envelopes, are going to get smaller and smaller. And this is the problem that this species faces. I had never seen a Cape Rock jumper flying 20 meters in one shot. They um, take short gliding flights from one rock to the other. They will then drop down, feed in the Feinbos and in the rest here. Um, we think that they are unable to hop, skip, or in their, their case, jump, jump, rock jumper across these valleys. It is not known whether they will have the ability to trek across these valleys. In fact, the birds ringed at, at Roy Als um, by Phoebe Barnard, etc., had never been recaptured at Fernkloof up on Rotary Drive, etc., and vice versa. So these birds are essentially isolated, and this brings about this wonderful concept that, that Krista coined of, of sky islands. And in a way, the Cape Rock Jumper, Victorin's Warbler, and the Feinbos Button Quail are all basically captured in these climate envelopes. They are unable to move to other areas. And then Proteus Seed Eater and Victorin's Warbler, to a lesser degree, are all also sort of encapsulated and caught up in this. And this is why we certainly need to do everything in our power to conserve Feinbos habitats. It's absolutely critical. Otherwise, we're going to lose these incredibly valuable species. BirdLife South Africa um, published a wonderful little booklet um, on bird-friendly habitat management guidelines for the endemic birds of the Feinbos habitat. This was Dale Wright and Alan Lee wrote the book booklet. It gives a very good overview of the Feinbos species, but then it comes up with a range of recommendations on what should be done in order to preserve these Feinbos habitats. And I will just touch a few of these. Obviously, as far as possible, we need to really fight alien invasive species and um, eradicate them as far as possible. And this is why collaboration with all of the hacking groups are just so vitally, vitally important. Their recommendation is obviously um, that it's a priority to clear the lightly infested areas first in order to really try and re-establish pristine Feinbos habitats. But for most of, of you um, WCC members, um, this would be common knowledge and um, something that um, would be fairly obvious to you. The avoidance of the clearing of existing Feinbos patches and, and um, well, yeah, um, all of us that are vehemently opposed to the Armanus bypass, all of us that are oppose various facets of the Fernkloof PAMP, the um, Protected Areas Management Plan, all of us 
that were very upset by the proposal for the development of a distillery at the Royal site. Um, it's obvious that we need to try and protect Feinbos patches as far as possible. And this is what where collaborative work between all of our agencies, all of the organizations with an interest in Feinbos need to collaborate and, and work together. And I hope that in future we can do so increasingly. The whole matter of fire regimes is problematic. Um, it's all very well um, to say that we need to allow appropriate fire regimes in natural fainbos patches wherever possible and to avoid burning the felt in, in winter and spring. That's fairly obvious. But with the, um, I think one should call it arson, um, with the people um, causing fires um, and the increasing number of, of these massive fires that go through our mount, mountain fainbos, it's becoming really problematic. I mean, if, if you look, I, I think the classic example is those kids at Horston that um, started the one big fire because they love watching the choppers um, fire, um, water bombing the fires. Um, it, it's a hugely problematic um, issue. And we really need to do everything in our power to collaborate with the authorities, the fire departments, etc., to try and stop these fires um, wherever possible. Because um, the, the increasing number of fires are just creating a massive, massive problem in the sense that the Feinbos doesn't get enough time to recover. I don't want to do too much, talk too much about pesticides. It is obvious that, that we need to, to look at environmentally friendly products if there is something like that. Um, but the increasing worldwide use and, and um, work at looking at the utilization of, of birds of prey to, to assist us um, in our, our fight with, with rodents, etc., is, is really gaining momentum all over the show. I'm, I'm deliberately not talking a, a lot about our boxes because that in itself is controversial. I could just... Um, I always put Gerrit Verduren's telephone number. It's a 24-hour hotline um, concerning um, chemicals and poisons. Um, so if you need guidance on the type of poisons to use, if you need to um, get rid of, of old poisons in your garage, if you want to poison your wife, Gerrit is the guy to, to approach. And that is a very, very handy number, 082-446-8946. And as I said, it's a 24-hour hotline um, that is really useful, particularly for farmers. The over-abstraction of water is, is um, a, a huge issue, and we need to ensure that the ecological water requirements of river courses and water systems need to be maintained as far as possible. Um, a huge issue in our area, um, and, and there are specific areas, particularly in the Langeberg uh, region, for argument's sake, where this is a major issue. Overgrazing of natural areas is a big problem. And then particularly as far as Renosta felt habitats is concerned. One of my favorite conservation agencies is um, the Overberg Renosta felt Conservation Trust. Um, they are doing fantastic work with signing appeasement with farmers, getting farmers to preserve 
natural Rhinoster felt patches on their farms. They are really, really um, gaining a lot of ground in, in that regard. And um, their work really needs to be supported. It is very similar to the WWF's um, Biodiversity Wine Initiative. And um, as far as possible, we need to encourage um, all work that they are doing in, in view of assisting those Renosterfeld specialists that, that are in dire, dire straits. Here I am talking of Southern Black Koran. Um, if you look at car counts, car counts are coordinated avian road counts that are done twice and in some cases four times a year. They do specific routes and they drive them with specific method methodology. They stop every two, hour, uh, two kilometers, count all the large birds in the area. But if you look at the reduction in numbers of, of Southern Black Koran over the years with the car counts, then it really becomes scary. If you go to the West Coast National Park and to Bontebok National Park, the moment you go into the pristine Rhinosterfell, you get fairly good numbers of these birds and you can see them. But once you go out of these reserves um, in the agricultural areas, et cetera, where there's very little fainbos, um, uh, Rhinosterfell left, then um, they essentially disappear, which, which is so sad. This bird is in dire straits. There's huge research being done at the moment in view of, of trying to protect this species. But um, this is one of the guys that, that are, are really in trouble. Sorry, I, I just have to include Brian's photograph in, in my talks. Isn't this youngster just too cute for words? Lovely little bird and a marvelous photograph taken in the West Coast National Park. The Black Harrier breeds on the ground in pristine fainbos. So there are patches around Nivotsville, the West Coast National Park, the Gullis National Park, where there are really potent and, and strong breeding populations of these birds still. But the moment that you move out of those areas where there's protected Rhinosterfeld, then their numbers drop dramatically. I mean, there had been studies of these birds with, with transmitters. Um, when they start walkies, when they go on their nomadic travels in, in, in summertime, um, a girl, a female, starts off at the West Coast National Park and she flies directly in one uninterrupted flight straight into Bontebok National Park at Swellen Dam. These birds, interestingly enough, in these very hot summers, go on nomadic, nomadic type of migrations into the foothills of the Drakensberg, where it is cooler. So they spend a lot of their summer up there in the Drakensberg, only to return then to the pristine Renoster felt patches to breed. There are quite a few good spots in the Eastern Cape as well, where they are breeding. And one hopes that all of the research and all of the energy that's pushed into research about these birds will bring this absolutely iconic species back from the, the dire point that they are in at this point in time. The only reason that I include a gullus long lark in this discussion is due to the fact that this bird has such a small distribution range. 
that is found from about Caledon through to Marshall Bay in the Overberg and um, in previously in, in pristine Renosterfeld, but they had taken um, very well to denuded areas that they, they like um, overgrazed areas, etc., and um, fallow land. So they are safe. It looks as if they are, are expanding. I'm doing research in, in the Langeberg region at the moment, and it is found that these birds are scored in the Langeberg region in areas um, around Robertson and, and McGregor, etc. So it looks as if it's gradually expanding its range, but due to its small distribution range, it is massively, massively popular. The blue gray on these feathers on the wing and the tail is typical of the species. We try our best um, in, in our column in Landbau Wehrblatt to, to get farmers to understand these concepts and it seems as if we are gradually um, winning, uh, particularly with birders, uh, with farmers in, in the Klein Karoo and the Karoo proper. So we hang in there and we just try and, and get these messages through as far as possible. The last recommendation um, from the BirdLife publication is that one plants indigenous species, preferably locally occurring feinbos around homesteads, which is in itself controversial, particularly if you live in Betty's Bay after that horrific fire that went through there. But uh, a lot of people are encouraging um, gardeners to, to go for locally occurring feinbos in their gardens in our region. If we ask, but what, what can we do besides these fairly theoretical concepts that I, I discussed? Obviously, on a personal level, we can all try and, and become green as far as possible, reducing travel and associated fuel emissions, assisting with carbon offset schemes, reducing one's use of and reliance on the national energy grid, etc. cetera. Um, I think that whatever one can do to try and turn this massive storm facing us around, um, one should try and do. And then obviously all of the conservation agencies of which I, I mentioned a few here should collaborate on all of these threats to our Fainbos, um, because I think that, well, uh, not think, uh, we, we in, in the Overstrand certainly have a very, very potent um, environmental lobby that, that um, is in, uh, collaborating increasingly in, in view of um, battling some of the threats to our habitats that I had mentioned briefly. Just briefly on the Bird of the Year campaign, it's a campaign run by BirdLife South Africa EPA. It's the Cape Rock Jumper this year. Uh, they had developed fantastic posters, um, very informative posters. But besides that, you can download fantastic educational resources, lecture packs, curriculum based from BirdLife's website. I've still have a lot of these posters available. Um, if you want to disseminate these to schools um, for your grandchildren, etc., etc., but encourage children, youngsters to download the lecture packs from the um, from BirdLife's website. They are very informative and they do also concentrate on warming habitats and, and the impact of climate change on these birds. So very informative. Please let all teachers know about this because um, it is vital that we get these 
message us through and, and contact me if, if you want to receive some of these posters. Just as an aside, um, I'm doing, I'm developing a bird finder webpage for the Langeberg local municipal region. And I had looked at research done by Professor Jerry Brookhazen in the 1960s and Rob Martin in later years. And I had compared the species counts and lists that they had done in those days with what, with what we have with the South African Bird Atlas project in these days. Now, what's interesting is that a whole range of what we believed or in the 60s were believed were Karoo species now occur in areas around Montague, around Robertson as such. And, and just a, a few of them, um, the Karoo aromomala, black-headed canary, Karoo chat, and the Namakwa sakerbeki, uh, dusky sunbird, are all birds that are now scored regularly. In other words, they had moved east. What are we saying? We are saying that it is probably getting drier, but it is definitely getting hotter. And these birds are moving. If we look at the Overberg, 20 years ago, I nearly overturned a bucky when Elaine told me there are Karoo Korans outside um, De Whip. You know, we, I thought the woman was crazy, but we are, BirdLife Overberg have monthly counts and we score Karoo Koran in the Overberg just about every single month today. And then if, if you look at the Karoo scrub robin um, and um, the Namakwa dove, they are now common in our area. We are even getting records of the fantastic rufous eared warbler in the um, Overberg these days. So what am I saying? I'm saying it's far beyond the whole matter of Feinbos endemics. There's a massive change in our endemic birds. And um, this global warming issue is with us and is real and is here to stay. Lastly, just I want to focus briefly on why the Cape Whale Coast is so crucial. Um, we've got wonderful birds. I, I've discussed some of the Feinbos endemics. I haven't even touched on the Benguela current endemics. We have fantastic birding opportunities at a whole range of, of top destinations um, throughout the Overstrand. Um, keep in mind that I have uh, detailed descriptions of these on the um, Western Cape Birding website. Um, they are all described in detail. We've got uh, the pelagic birding um, out of Clainby, um, the penguin colony at Stony Point is world renowned, and then the migratory waders that visit Botflay and, and De Mont. Um, and we've got a, a relatively well sorted website um, describing all of, of these spots, even if I have to say so myself. If you flash this brag list, in front of volleys or, or international birders, they drool. I mean, if you just look at, there are, if you look at the Benguela current endemics, there are eight. There are eight Feinbos endemics. There are lots of pelagic birds to be seen. Um, uh, incidentally, this time of year with these heavy cold fronts coming through, there's fantastic pelagic birding from shore um, in our region. The waders visiting our, uh, our estuaries in summertime is, is world renowned. But then just look at this brag list. This is why we are working so hard to market our region 
and, and to get people to get here. Just keep in mind that the more people that visit the area, see how special these birds are, find out how much pressure there is on these birds, the better, because we can increase the environmental lobby to um, look, try and get more people to look after these birds. Just um, two events that BirdLife Overberg is, is presenting in, in the rest of the month. On Monday evening, our, our monthly bird talk, I will focus on the Overberg wheat belt and birding particularly in winter months. In other words, without the migrants. Um, I've got 70 fairly common species um, in the talk, 36 of those are endemic or near endemic, just showing you how really crucial this area is and how special it is. I mean, where else in the world except for the Galapagos will you get such a high rate of endemics in the region? Um, just drop me an email. Uh, I didn't have space on the slide here. To, to put the Zoom invitation link in, um, drop me an email and I will send you the invitation link. And then at the last week of the month, we are doing our introductory bird identification and appreciation course again. Um, we are doing this with a difference in the sense that we're battling to get people to get together at six o'clock on a Monday night or whatever the case might be. And all of these talks are pre-recorded and then um, forwarded to participants with WeTransfer. We will look at the basic principles of identifying a bird. We will concentrate in the second talk on, on garden birds and the identification. In the third talk, I will focus on attracting birds and other wildlife to the garden. Then we'll do water birds, and then I will highlight the, the best birding spots in our region. Um, contact Elaine uh, about people. And if you've got family members, friends on the outside looking in at this wonderful hobby of birding, um, let them join us um, and, and let, let us get them hooked. I would just like to thank all the people that I had bumped photographs from to, to put together this talk. Um, much appreciated. And Anita, Anita, I'm going to throw it over to you. Um, I will gladly take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anton. That was um, a really interesting and thought provoking uh, um, talk. Um, I, I just want to mention to our participants that you're free to ask your questions um, verbally. If you want to just press your space bar or unmute yourself, you can ask your question or otherwise just type something in the chat function. Um, let me kick off, Anton. Uh, is there any estimate of how much uh, economic uh, benefit there is to the Overberg area through AV tourism? Oops. Um, I've got it in another talk. Um, and with my age, it's going to be very difficult to... Um, look, the... the, the Essential point being that um, birding tourism is the fastest growing ecotourism component worldwide these days. Um, BirdLife South Africa has statistics on this. I don't want to speculate off the top of my head of the millions that are involved, but I think that if one looks at the Overstrand or the Overberg in particular, then one needs to look at not only our birds, 
which are absolutely fantastic. But all of the Feinbos, all of our whales, all of those things combined, the shark diving, etc., all of those tourism products combined really makes a, a outstanding suite of attractions. And if you just look at the number of inquiries that we get for guiding at, at this point in time, um, and, and people booking well in advance, uh, this week I, I handled um, a request for summertime already. Um, it is really growing rapidly, but I, I still maintain that the important thing is that we are not doing enough to market our area. I, I think we really need to pull people off the end too. We nearly look, have to look at getting people traveling between the Garden Route and Cape Town or the Eastern Cape and Cape Town to do come our way sort of thing, um, simply due to the fact that, that we've got a, a wonderful suite of, of um, ecotourism products. True, true. I can, if you want to, um, give you the figures um, or, or just send you a brief little um, that will be, yeah, report that will on be, that. be great, Anton, if you can give me some information, I can put it in my newsletter that goes out at the beginning of next month to all our members. That okay. would be very helpful. There are quite a few questions in the chat function. <clears throat> the yes, first sir. one is from, uh, uh, I'm, oh, I'm off to the West Coast Park for a few nights and have borrowed a spotter scope for the seabirds. Any specials I should particularly look out for, Anton? And I think that is from uh, Karen Malan. Um, Karen, well, firstly, I, I will send you the talk on the West Coast National Park um, with um, we transfer. But if at this time of year, keep in mind that you, you don't have uh, a lot of um, migrants in town, so you, you wouldn't... Um, expect that you would get a, a, a lot of the migratory waders except for those few species that tend to overwinter but those are young birds um, but but if you go to Tarbank um, and particularly if you've got poor weather really lack of storm coming through you really can expect to get quite a few of of the pelagics in the area we had um, um, seen stuff like um, watch and petrol and stuff from Tarbank in the past. Uh, a wonderful area, but I would um, certainly give you more information through the talk. Good. Another question, Anton, from Pat. Can you please comment on the bird feeders, sugar water bottles, and scattering of commercial seed and corn to attract birds? Hermanus Baboon Action Group feels strongly that residents should be discouraged from feeding birds as this also attracts baboons, yeah. but also impacts on all the factors you've indicated. Why try to encourage residents, we try to encourage residents to plant indigenous flowering plants instead of feeding with seed. That I'm going to get you for this. Um, I was dreading this question and I knew it's gonna come. Um, in my talk on attracting birds to the garden, we, we concentrate heavily on, on looking at um, planting indigenous, um, particularly locally ind indigenous, if that is the, the, the correct phrase to use. Yes, there are far more problems than just bird um, baboons being attracted um, to these feeders, etc. There are studies indicating, for argument's sake, that Cape sugar birds pick up a particular fungus. If the um, nectar feeders are not washed regularly, um, there are increasing research. Um, and the 
report that I referred to by, by Monique Duplessis that, that appeared recently, last two weeks or so, is really concentrating heavily on moving away from feeders, um, close, particularly feeders close to Feinbos habitats. I think that that is the message. If you are, uh, if you live in Joburg, for argument's sake, and, and there's not much you can do, then it's, it's a sort of a selfish human endeavor to, um, you know, put out seeds and stuff and attract um, birds to your garden. But I think there's an increasing movement away from feeders. Um, very little doubt about it. And what I find interesting is that there's hardcore research coming through um, indicating that, that we should not go down that road. So in principle, I agree, yes, undoubtedly, particularly us living um, in the Overstrand where we are very, very close to um, um, Feinbos habitats. Yes, I agree in principle. Yeah, and I've also read somewhere that um, if we keep feeding these birds on artificial nectar, i.e. sugar water, it also discourages them from um, catching enough insects which they need for the protein. Would that be a true comment? Uh, yes, um, look, the vast majority of the nectar of feeders um, take a lot of um, insects, particularly um, spiders. And um, I, I'm not sure whether they, there's, they will take less. If, if I just look um, across the road from my kitchen, there's a, a, a bottle brush, a huge bottle brush in my neighbor's garden. Um, we've counted 49 species in that bottle brush until now, which is crazy. Um, but um, if I just look at the sugar birds and, and sunbirds in there, they are continually flying out and catching insects, um, particularly prior to breeding season, which is now. Um, remember that, that these birds, um, the, the sunbirds and sugarbirds are inverted. They, they breed in winter in our area. Winter rainfall area, lots of flowers in the feinbos. That is why we haven't got um, sun, um, sugar birds in our gardens at this point in time. But the moment they finish um, breeding, um, they'll be back in town. Thank you. Anton, uh, um, uh, if there are no other questions, um, anyone else would like to ask a question? Just press your space bar and speak. But um, in the absence of any more questions, Anton, thank you so much. That was a really interesting talk. And um, we ag I agree uh, that we need to do a lot more to advertise the wonderful um, ecotourism opportunities of all kinds that we have in our area. Um, I feel a bit schizophrenic about that because obviously the more tourism we have, the, the heavier the carbon footprint. Yeah. But um, it, uh, unfortunately, that is uh, something that we'll have to live with and ask people to visit when they do visit us to, to visit uh, carbon neutral or eco-friendly um, establishments while they are here and support the local um, endeavors to uh, conserve our habitats for all of our wonderful animals. So Anton, thank you very much and thank you for everyone who um, logged in to our talk this evening. We'll hope to see you next month. We'll let you know the date and the speaker for uh, August. Um, it's going to be a very exciting one. So please look out for your newsletter at, uh, at the first day of August. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you, Anina. Meneer die vraag kijk voor ek.